Titus chapter 1. We carry on through the book of Titus in our studies, uh, Sunday mornings here. We are in verse 4 this morning, in verse 4. But before I carry on, for those that, um, that listens online, um, we have, I do normally Sunday mornings when I do our message, I hand out with our bulletins, I hand out some notes of the messages, of some basic notes of the message I'm teaching with some Bible scripture references, etc., if you're interested, those online, if you're interested in, in having a copy of this, I'd be happy to email you a copy on a Saturday night or a Sunday morning early um, so that you can have a copy of that if you would like to, you know, listen to the message afterwards and follow it on the notes. I'll be happy to give you the notes, but you need to contact me and you can just do that by sending a message to Grace Way Des. GraceWayDes at gmail.com. GraceWayDes at gmail.com. And I'll send you the notes if you'd like that in a PDF format. All right. So we're in, we're in um, Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1. Let's go read from verse 1. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect, and the acknowledging of the truth which is of the godliness. In hope of eternal life, which God, that cannot lie, promised before the world began. But hath in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me, according to the commandment of God our Savior. To Titus, mine own son, after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. Let's open in prayer. Father, we are thankful for your word again. We are always thankful for that you have given your word by inspiration, but you've also preserved it for us, so that we can read and study it today, knowing it is as your word of truth, as we read and study it in the King James Bible. We're thankful for the, your all-sufficient grace always for us. We're thankful that we can consider your word, and as we consider it, that you give us the understanding in all things, as we believe your word and trust your word and are persuaded by it, it effectually works in us and produces in us that purpose uh, that you've purposed it for in our lives as we walk according to you, the truth of your word, as your spirit um, guides us in truth, in your word working in us. As we praise you for that, and we're thankful for the saints here this morning, and we commend our time to you by Christ with thanksgiving. Amen. So we in verse 4. To Titus, mine own son, after the common faith. Last week we talked about Paul's message, the preaching that was committed unto him, the preaching that was committed unto Paul. He says, in due times manifested. And we talked about due times. Due times, if you strictly consider due times, due times preaching is really Israel's due times. But God saved Paul out of that due times you know, and send him as an apostle to the Gentiles with a message of God's grace. We talked about that. You can listen to last week's message if you want. But in verse 4, he says, To Titus, mine own son. Obviously, the book is called the book of Titus, right? <laughs> if it's the book of Titus, it's written to Titus. It's written to an individual, not to a church, to an individual. But you and I today, we sit here as a church. We sit here and read the book of Titus. Now, the Titus is not written to an individual, you and me, now it's been given by inspiration, it's preserved for us so that you and I can read it collectively as a church and see God's standard of order, God's order for the local church. Paul, Titus has to set things in order. He needs to preach sound doctrine. When he preaches sound doctrine, it produces good works. The church needs to be careful to maintain good works. How will we know, how will we know these things unless we study Titus or Timothy, or Philippians, or Philemon, sorry, the, the so-called pastoral epistles. But Paul is writing to Titus, and he calls him mine own son, mine own son. I like that language. Titus in no means was Paul's physical son, okay? Titus, Titus, you know, Paul was a single guy. Paul says, I would like you to remain in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. He says, I would like you to remain as I am. Don't get married. You know, he's very clear about that. So, he doesn't have physical kids, children. But Titus, he calls him a son because Titus, like Timothy, has so, was so dear, it was very dear to the Apostle Paul. 
You might actually think about the Apostle Paul to the end of his life. As Paul is at the end of his life and he's facing certain death coming, and Paul is facing the end of life, and there's a few people that's still around him that are faithful. You know, and, and how dear in difficult times and in hard times, uh, how dear those relationships, those relationships become to you, like Titus and like Timothy, in, 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 in working alongside with you. And he calls Titus my, my, uh, uh, my own son. So look at a couple of passages with me, if you will, concerning Titus. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 2. As Paul, is, his, his fondness of Titus, his love for Titus, just like Timothy. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. You know, I would love to be a Titus, and I would love to be a, um, a Timothy to somebody. You know, and I'm sure you would love to be a Titus, but usually ladies, you'll say, well, I can't be a Titus, okay? No, you can't identify as that. You can identify as a Titus in the biblical sense, but in, not in this world today, okay? You're going to have to change your name to another name, uh, not Titus, okay? But you can be that same the type of person that Titus was, you know, and, and Timothy was, and some of the other guys around Paul. Um, second, second Corinthians chapter 2, Paul is ministering there, He's, he's speaking to the Corinthians, but some heaviness on his heart. By the way, if you want to understand Paul's heart in the ministry, if you understand what Paul went through in the work of the ministry, and the struggles he went through, you've got to read 2 Corinthians carefully. And if you read 2 Corinthians carefully, you can see the hardships, the, the, the struggles that he went through. He says, you know, look at chapter 2. It starts off there in chapter 2, verse 1. He says, but I determined this with myself that I would not come again to you in heaviness. So that means the first time he came in heaviness, I don't want to come to you again in what? In heaviness. For if I make you sorry, who is he that maketh me glad? But the same which is made sorry by me? Question mark. So if I come and make you sorry and I'm all over you because you're just misbehaving carnal and whatever and not spiritual, who's going to lift me up? Who's going to build me up if I'm just always just bang on you guys okay uh, so uh, and I wrote the same unto you lest that when I come I should have sorrow from them whom I ought to rejoice Paul says I get to your church I should be when I come to you I should rejoice you know but, but he says you know so so th that's already a heavy thing in his heart but now I want you to jump down with me to verse um, 12 verse 12 he says furthermore when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was open unto me of the Lord, I had no rest in my spirit, because I found not Titus my brother, but, make, but taking my leave of them, I went from thence into Macedonia. So Paul is now, he's saying, here's something else furthermore that sorrows me and gives me a heavy heart. When I was in Macedonia, I have a great door of utterance to preach Christ. You know, but what happens? I had no rest in my spirit because I found not Titus my what? He's so dear to him, he couldn't find him. He's concerned. Where is Titus? What has happened to Titus? Is he locked up? Is he killed? Is he missing an action? What's going on with Titus? He's really concerned about him. And he had no rest in his spirit. Here's the guy that has direct revelations, visions from the Lord, meeting the Lord, you know, being taken up into the third heaven. You know, this is a guy that is real close to the Lord, filled with the Spirit. However, he's gone through some difficult times. He says, I had no rest in my spirit. My inner man was restless all the time. I couldn't find him. I couldn't find him. You know, you, you guys are like this too. You know, you, you text somebody and they didn't answer you in two minutes and now suddenly you become very restless because they didn't answer you. You know they saw the text. You know the text they saw. They just choose to ignore your text and why they're not answering you in two minutes? Because maybe they're busy with something else. Right? Okay. But, so, so, but yes, you know, Titus, he has no rest in his spirit because he didn't find Titus his brother. I had no rest in my spirit, verse 13 says, in my spirit because I found not Titus my brother. So he's not just a son, he's what? He's a brother. He says, but taking my leave of them, I went in, into Macedonia. That's where he's looking for, he's looking for Titus. 
He says, Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ, and maketh manifest the savour of His knowledge by us in every place. You know, the beautiful thing about that verse 14 is, Thanks be unto God, which also cause, always causes us to triumph in Christ. You know where you're going to triumph? You know where we're going to triumph? Not in the circumstances of life. We will not triumph in the circumstances of life. We triumph in Christ. That's where we thrive, because I can overcome through Christ which strengtheneth me. I can deal with it, I can bear it, I can handle it, because Christ causes me to triumph. My circumstances doesn't determine my triumph. My triumph is concerned who I am and what God is doing in me. It's in Christ Jesus. I can face whatever comes to me. And we see Paul triumphing because Paul went through some really difficult things. You know, Paul's here, I had no rest in my spirit, but thanks be unto God, which always caused us to triumph where? In Christ. I didn't find Titus, but my triumph is where? In Christ. Now go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. It's the same epistle he's writing, and it's concerning Titus. You couldn't find Titus. Now verse 5. So Paul is leaving unto Macedonia. He's speaking about several things in between here. Verse 5 he says, When we were coming to Macedonia, our flesh had no rest. Alright, so we had no rest in his spirit. Then he comes into Macedonia. He says, When we come into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest. Not just his spirit, not just the inner man thing. His flesh had no rest. Had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Without were fightings. Within were what? Have you ever, ever experienced that? The, the inward fightings, the inward fears, is they always they, like, they, they take hold of you. But then was, he's without were fighting. There's people arguing and debating and wanting to get him. There's Jews laying in wait to kill this guy. They want to get rid of him. They don't want Saul, Paul to preach the gospel of God's grace. They don't want him to get out there. They want to kill him. As a matter of fact, there's a band of 40 of them that has taken a vow never to eat or to drink until Paul is dead. That's what this guy lived with. And he's just looking for Titus. I had no rest. Then he's not rest, not just in, any, in his inner man. He's, tr he's troubled. He's, he's within with fighting, within with fears and without with fightings. He's, he's going through a hard time in this. But look at the verse. He says, Nevertheless, God that comforted those that are cast down. Now remember this now. Remember this verse, because we're going to talk about it at the end of this message. Nevertheless, God that comforted those that are cast down, comforted us by the coming of Titus. Now remember that word, comfort them that are cast down, comfort us by the coming of Titus. That's mercy. That's mercy, God's mercy. Okay? But he says, Comfort us by the coming of Titus, and not by his coming only, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you when he told us your earnest desire, your mourning, your fervent mind toward me, so that I rejoice the more. So the coming of Titus brought a what? A comfort to them. Sometimes, you know, somebody that is dear to us, especially in the work of the ministry, they're close to us. A lot of times in the ministry, you have people that, that forsake you, they just leave, and you never see them again. But sometimes some goes away, and then you... Titus didn't go away. Titus was busy. He was actively busy in the church of Corinth. But, he, 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 you know, he's comforted by the coming of Titus when he sees him. He is, he, just, that, just, the, just that presence of Titus with him brings him... Just that presence of Titus brings him such comfort, you know. And God's helping him to do that with, with Titus because if somebody means, if it was somebody that you dislike, you don't want to ever see it again, I show up and it's like, oh, you're again. Okay, whatever, you know. It's good seeing you. I'm lying. I'm putting a fake smile on my face. Good seeing you again. However, Titus, Paul sees him and Paul is comforted by God. In the, in, the, in the presence of... That's how much Titus meant to him. This is the guy he's living in Crete now. Okay? And to set things in order. And, and Titus is going to bring good news. Go back with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, the next chapter there concerning Titus. He's so dear to Paul in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse, verse 23. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 23. 
whether any do inquire of Titus, he is my, now we've learned Titus is my, my son, my dear son. He is my, he is a, 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 um, a brother. He says, verse 23 says, whether any do inquire of Titus, he is my partner and fellow helper concerning you. So Titus is not just a son, he's a, 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 a co-laborer. He's a partner. He's a fellow He's a, he's, a, he's a fellow helper. In the ministry, we need partners. We need fellow helpers. We need people that stand with us and, and, and minister with us. Partners, fellow helpers. You know, partners and fellow helpers don't break one, break one another down. Partners and fellow helpers as is, is, is part of the edification process because that's what a partner does. We stand together. We have fellowship. We work together. We're a fellow helper. This was for Titus for him. He can call him a, 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 a partner and a fellow helper. Go with me quickly to First Timothy chapter 1 and see what Paul says about Timothy. Similar things about Timothy. First Timothy and then you can go to Second Timothy chapter 1 as well. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and 2 Timothy chapter 1. We're focusing on Titus, my own son, at the moment. 1 Timothy <clears throat> chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior, and the Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope, unto Timothy, my own son, where? In the faith. We'll look at that verse just now again. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, according to the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dearly beloved son. He goes from my son in the faith to Timothy, my dearly beloved son. He's, he's, he's expressing to Timothy, obviously by inspiration of the Holy Ghost, he's, he's expressing to Timothy that he's his dearly beloved son. You're very special to me. You're very dear to me. I think he felt the same way about Titus. Timothy was a little bit more timid than Titus. Titus was like, you know, he's assertive. You know, you get around Titus, he's an assertive guy. Timothy is a little bit more timid, okay? But he says, he calls him my dearly beloved son. Dearly beloved son. You know, and Paul at the end of his ministry, and toward the end of his life, you know, he's having this, the, he's, 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 he's identifying this importance of beloved people around him, and he has beloved sons that he's trained in the ministry. You know, and so you're not my sons, you know, but you're my fellow helpers. Your fellow laborers, you know. Closest thing that I can have to a beloved son is, is, is brother, brother, brother Robert out there, you know. But he's always, you know, giving me a hard time. I don't know why, you know. But um, so, you know, it's the closest I would have. You know, I have, a, I have a physical son. I love my son. I do love my son a lot. My son Luke, I do love him a lot. But Luke and I don't have, he's not my son in the faith per se. He's not co-laboring and working alongside with me in the ministry with a mutual faith, a mutual purpose, the same purpose. You understand that? And so Paul has these people around him and he thanks God for them. And we need to have those guys around him. By the way, look at Philippians. Go with me to Philippians. The book of Philippians chapter 2. Verse 19 to 22, also Philippians chapter 2, verse 19 about Timothy. Verse 19 he says, But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy as shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. So Timothy naturally is somebody that cares for the state of those he's ministering to. And he's looking forward to hear back from Timothy concerning them. Verse 21. For all seek their own, and not the things which are Jesus Christ, which tells me Titus, uh, Titus, Timothy is seeking not his own, but the things which are Christ. 
But ye know the proof of him, that is of Timothy, that as a son with the father, he has served with me in the gospel. As a son with a father. He's not even his real son, but he's as a son with a father. That's the closeness that he has um, with Titus and, 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 and Timothy and other men in the ministry. And, and so, you know, but you think, okay, Paul, so you only have beloved sons in Titus and in Timothy. Is there anybody else? Obviously, you can talk about Silas later on or somebody else. But go with me to second, but go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. What do you know about the Corinthian church? What is, if I ask you about the Corinthian church, what do you know about these people? What would you say about them? What would come to your mind? I said, what do you know about the Corinthian people? Were they like the Thessalonians, getting on, getting on with it, preaching, you know, love and hope and faith? Or are they a little bit problematic? Is there a lot of carnality and not spiritual walk among them? Is there things going on among these bunch of people that are not, not right? You know, yes. But look at 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 14. Paul is writing to them. He says, I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. What is he meaning by that? He calls the Corinthians, he's just called them in chapter 3, I could not speak to you as carnal, but as in bay, I, I speak to you as, but as not as spir a car, spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes. Are you not yet carnal? Now he says, as my beloved sons. So his beloved sons are carnal. Okay, not spiritual, but he calls him still his beloved sons. Did Paul love the saints? Yes. He called him his beloved son. How has he begotten them? How, how, can, how can he call them their sons? How would you call them their sons? He has begotten them through what? Through preaching the gospel. Now here's the thing that becomes in the ministry very, very interesting. Look at verse Verse 14, I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. For though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, this church at Corinth, these guys had not, not really 10,000 instructors in Christ. Now maybe you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, because you on social media, we have many people that can instruct us now, Right? But this, you know, he's using, using a metaphor here. Though we have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers, for in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. What's happening here? Paul says, I gave you the gospel. You got saved by the gospel. You, my beloved sons, I'm warning you, be careful. You have 10,000, though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, not really 10,000, but though you have 10,000 instructors, what's happening? Entering to the church in Corinth, what's a bunch of Jews that have dominion over these people, controlling them and telling them what they should do and shouldn't do, instead of listening to their father that has begotten them through the gospel and give attention to what Paul says. And we have the same thing going on in the church today. People, you know, they don't have many fathers in Christ. They have many instructors. 10,000 instructors in Christ. They listen to every Tom, Dick, and Harry out there and online and, 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 and it's all they do all day and every day. But they don't have many fathers in Christ. They don't appreciate their local fathers who is should be instructing them and they should be instructed by and so you know and and that's why we this a lot of these things that set in that in that church that is set in paul talks about these people that is these instructors in christ in second corinthians he says you know are they hebrews so am i you know he's identifying who they were these people that's influencing them anyway but paul He's talking to them as my beloved sons. He's a concern over them because you have a concern for your beloved sons. Let's go back to Titus. You guys with me there? Titus, chapter 1. So Paul says in verse 4, To Titus, mine own son. So we talked about Titus, talked a little about Timothy, talked about other sons. If you will... If you will think about this for a second, when you read this, you're not Titus, but you could be a son of Paul as you 
study the scriptures, as you follow Paul, and as, as he's dear to you, as, as, a, as a, almost like a father, he's an instructor, he's, he's the one that God sent. My own son, after the common faith. That word, common faith. Is, you see the word after there? To my own son, after the common faith? Now, when did that word come up before? Second, I'm in Titus chapter 1, verse 4. To Titus, my own son, after the common faith. The word after there. If you look at verse 1. An apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect. Do you see that word according? And it says, and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness, which becometh godliness, etc. Okay. Uh, and so, that stands true as godliness. That's the same way, after the common faith. Common faith is what Paul is, I believe Paul is speaking about here, is that which him and Titus mutually share. Now you and I commonly mutually share a faith too. And I trust that that's the same faith that you and I mutually share. You know, a common faith. And the common faith that unites Titus and Timothy together as a father with a son as a as as as, as co-laborers as beloved as as partners as fellow workers okay the common faith they stand together with but in some cases the word common can be considered that which is unclean or that which is defiled it's not what is used here but common could be used as unclean or defiled so sometimes when they use the word common is used. Now in Americans, you don't use the word common a lot. When I grew up, you know, people would say, you don't go down that street, you don't go in that little area there. Those people are common. That doesn't mean they have things, that, what they have in, 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 in union is, you know, just there's lots of drunkenness and there's a lot of weird stuff going on there. There's common people. We don't use that word common. But in the scriptures, you know, the, 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 the Israelites... With, 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 with speaking about the believers, those that believe Christ, as common. You know, they were common people, in, undefiled, defiled or unclean. That's, you know, get away from them, okay? But, you know, uncouth people are sometimes referred as common people. But here, Paul, the common means that which we mutually share. Now, Paul, you and I commonly share faith. Like we have a common faith. That makes us brothers. We share common faith with, with the rest of, rest of you. And, and that faith is the one faith, I believe. Another time the word common comes up. Look in, in Jude, the book of Jude. In the book of Jude, chapter 1, verse 3. The book of Jude... Well, let's go read the first three verses, if you will. Jude, and it's only one chapter there. Verse 1. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ, the brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ, and called. Who is he talking to? The believing remnant of the nation of Israel. He's talking to believers. Are these guys sanctified? Are they preserved? Yes or yes? The Bible says that. I'm going to say it. I'm just read you the verses. Believe the verses. Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which once was delivered unto the saints. He's talking about a common, not a common faith here, but a common salvation. A salvation we share. A common salvation. By the way, between the Jews and the Gentiles, between Israel and the body of Christ, today we have a common faith. There's only one faith that can save today. And when you're a Jew or a Gentile, there's no more Jew, there's no more Gentile. We share a common faith, a common salvation. Now that's not the common salvation he's specifically talking about there, but you can see the point I'm saying, that which we share, that which we have in common together. By the way, to the world out there, we're talking about that negative use of the word common, the common faith that you and I share. The world outside there says to you and I that we are common. We are the base things of the world. We are the off-scouring. We are the, 
you're the filth of the world, you know, they don't want to see us as, 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 as what God sees us as. Look at for me at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. First Corinthians chapter one, verse twenty six. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty. And the base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. So, who's the base? Who is the, 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 the weak? And all these things. In the light of the world, you're uneducated, you don't know any better, you're just foolish to believe this, you're base. You're not educated. I remember a day, I, I've maybe shared it with you guys many, many years ago. I was sitting at a, uh, I was at a function and um, I was sitting at a table with highly edu ed educated, a husband and a wife, highly educated, master's degrees and, and honors and just everything. I think they were even doctors in, in their fields of you know, study. And we sat, I was sitting there, just me, common old days, sitting down there and, and, and we started talking about the Bible. And I remember them stopping me and say, whoa, whoa, what qualifications do you have? Well, I said, well, I have the Word of God, and I've got Holy Ghost in me, and I'm a saint of the Most High God, and, and that's who I am. I don't have any education, you know, I'm not very educated, you know, and so, just, you know, I'm nobody special. And, um, you know, they said, well, we can't have this conversation with you because you're not educated enough to talk to us. And I, I just remember that it's, it's always comes to my mind that, 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 you know, I just had the scriptures and they didn't, want to talk about, they didn't want to talk about the philosophy of man. Now, I'm not educated in the philosophy of man. But, you know, when I gave them the word of God, they didn't like that. They wanted to talk about philosophy of man. I'm not interested in talking about that. And so they called me the base things. You're the base things. You're foolish to believe that stuff. You're not, you're not worthy. But God brings him to confound the wise. You remember what happened to Saul of Tarsus when he was among that other, other Pharisees is coming up and arguing with Stephen? They couldn't contend with his wisdom. He confounded them. I think that's where Saul of Tarsus was pricked in his heart. Part of that. Anyway, so, you know, they call us common, but you know what? Are we weak? No, we're strong. You know? Are we despised in the eyes of the world? Yes, but we are loved by God. We are sanctified. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter, chapter 1 there. He says, that no flesh should, verse 29, that no flesh should glory in His presence, but of Him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as is written, he, hath glory, glo 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 he that glorieth, let him glory where? In the Lord. I like chapter 6. I'm just going to read that quickly to you and I'm going to move on. And verse 11 says, And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified. But ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. That's who we are. The world sees us as common. But we have a common faith. We have a faith that we share. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. When it comes to the Word of God, when it comes to what God's Word is saying, you and I can argue about different views of God's Word, different understandings of God's Word. Maybe I'm right, maybe you're right. I don't know, always. Sometimes I just have an understanding to a certain degree, or, or this is my opinion about this, and maybe your opinion of your understanding is different to mine. But let me tell you something, there's not two rights in one purpose in God's Scriptures. There's one right. There's one, there's just one right. One of us is going to be wrong. If we differ, one of us, maybe both of us will be wrong. But if we differ, at least one of us could be right. Does that make sense to you? 
Look what he says in Ephesians chapter 4. He says, I, verse, chapter one, verse 1, I therefore the presence of the Lord beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one what? Faith, one what? Baptism, one God and Father of all is above all and through all and on you. There is one faith. What is that one faith? It is what God is doing today. There is one faith. There's, and you have to believe what God said. You believe God's word, rightly divided. That's the one faith, if I just quickly sum it up like that. You can't have different faith. You know, years ago, again, maybe I shared this with you guys. Can't remember. I was um, living in, a, in, 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 in Cape Town, and um, we started the church there in Cape Town. And some of the local preachers recognized that I was there and now having a starting a church. So they invited me to their minister's forum on a Thursday morning, once a month or twice a month. On a Thursday morning, all the preachers in the area come together and we talk and we have, you know, we just build one another up. And I'm like, yeah, initially I said, no, it's just, I'm just busy. And eventually I said, okay, I'll go. I went in there and I sat there and I remember the one time we sat in there and it's all these preachers and they were talking about unity and they were talking about how can we be unified and work together and they talked about everything except sound doctrine and I just sat there and I listened and I listened I didn't participate really and eventually one of the guys turns to me and says you quiet you don't have anything to say and I said, well, you know, I said, we're sitting around here. I said, you, brother, you know, your church, I know what, you, 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 you baptize infant babies and you sprinkle them with water. I said, you dunk them, you dunk adults once. You dunk adults, you think once is not enough, it has to be three times. I said, let me read you a passage, and I read them Ephesians chapter 4, and I read these verses to them, and I said, you want unity, that's where it's going to be found, in, in the one Lord, one faith, one baptism, that's where it's going to be found, and that's where we can have unity, and if we can't describe the doctrine, we can't walk together in this. Now, obviously, they didn't ask me to come back again, <laughs> you know, and... Um, but I said, our unity can only be in, in, in this doctrine. You know, we, we, outside of that, yeah, we can take with the world and have all things mutual. All roads don't lead to Rome, guys. There's one faith. And Paul and Titus shared that common faith. My own son after the common faith. They shared that. You know what Peter calls it? He calls it like precious faith. A like precious faith. I love that. I love that statement. Peter says, Simon Peter, servant unto the, uh, 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 and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us. Have you obtained like precious faith? Yes, we have. We have obtained it. We have to obtain it through the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. We've preached, we have that like precious faith because of the message of God's grace today. Paul says to the Romans, in Romans chapter 1 verse 12, you know, I want to be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. We want to be on the same place, on the same place that we are. We mutually want to share that and be of one mind in that. And that's why he has the confidence to leave Titus, Paul, to leave Titus at Crete, to set things in order, because he has the confidence that he has the mutual faith, they have the, the common faith together, and they stand together in that. And that's the message they're preaching. And he has, he has the full confidence he can leave Titus at Crete to set things in order. Alright? And so we thank, we thank God that we can have that mutual faith. And that, that's something in Ephesians chapter 4. He says, you know, Paul says, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Endeavoring. That word endeavoring. That means you and I need to be very diligent about it. We need to be out there endeavoring, pressing forward, study. Consider these things. The word endeavor and study is the same word. Be diligent. Get on with it. 
and to keep that precious faith. Now, I don't know where our time is, but go back with me to, to Titus. All right, there we go. And Titus he says, To Titus, mine own son, after the common faith. Yeah, we have sons. You know, when you teach something somebody else and they teach somebody else, I think those that you teach become like a beloved son. Like you need to treat them as such. And, 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 um, and, and they do such with the others. But he says to him, Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father. What do you notice there in Titus chapter 1? Grace, mercy, and peace. Paul writes 13 epistles, right? 13 epistles. And in the 13 epistles, only four of us, or for only four of those, he says, grace, mercy, and peace. The rest, he says, grace and peace from God our Father. The pastoral epistles is epistles that start up with grace, mercy, and peace. He knows Titus is going to need some special mercy from God in the execution of his duties as he's going to work with these bunch of liars. The Cretes are always liars. You know, and a bunch of Jews that's in that local church that is influencing the Jews always cause chaos everywhere they go in the churches where Paul went he says don't frown like that I'm not talking about Jews today yeah okay in Paul's day in the churches the guys that create problem for Paul was the Jews right so they were always problems and lies look at Titus you can read chapter 1 you'll see what he says about them okay and so you know, the, look at verse 10. He says, For there are many un, unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision. Who's the circumcision? It's the Jews. They are, they are vain talkers, deceivers. That's who they are. So Paul's going to send them among those vain talkers and deceivers. He's going to among these liars, who's the Christians, and slow bellies, lazy people. He's going to send him here, and Titus is going to need a special dispensation, if you will, of God's mercy as he executes his orders, and as he executes what God has given him to do there. He's going to need mercy, not just grace and peace. Grace is God's riches at Christ's expense, we use the acronym, but it's the unmerited favor of God. We know that. Grace and peace is the official declaration God has on a, on a, on a Christ-rejecting world today is grace and peace to you instead of wrath. Our message today is grace and peace, not wrath. Our, gra our message is the grace of God be upon you. Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. The message in the gospel of God's grace is yours. And when you have that, you can have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ because you have justified by faith by the gospel of God's grace, you have peace with God. But Paul says, you can have grace, Timothy, Titus. And we, wish you, we pray for grace for you. We greet you with grace, but we greet also with peace. But we need you, we pray also for mercy for you. Because he's going to need it. Now what's the difference between grace and mercy? My time's up, and we didn't get into that, you know. And, and, and so, <coughs> quickly, and we'll start off here next time again, okay. But, but, but grace being the, 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 the um, unmerited favor of God, mercy is used in a sense of benevolence, pity, compassion to those that are in distress. The word mercy means that, okay? And God is a merciful God. We want to talk about that next week, okay? Mercy gets us out of punishment. Mercy gets us out of punishment. When we deserve a certain punishment... When you know, my dad says to you, you need a spanking, son. But he says, I'm, I'm going to show you mercy today. That gets me out of that punishment. Mercy gets you out of punishment, but grace is the one that paid the price. You know, when, 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 a, when, a, when a judge says to you, you are guilty. And you need to do five years in prison or you need to pay $10,000. But I'm not going to send you that. I'm going to show you mercy. Because that person there paid your debt for you. Mercy, you know, is, is when we don't deserve it, we get it. And, 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 and so, and, and Paul, and, 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 and there's times in, in Paul's life, you know, the mercy of God. Remember I shared you that verse in, in Corinthians. 
When Titus showed up, you know, wow, there's, there's Titus. And we found comfort of God by the coming of Titus. That's mercy. God showed him mercy. The guy that he's, we're going to talk about this next week because I don't want to rush through this. But, but, the, but the guy in Philippians that was nigh unto death, but he, he didn't die. And God showed mercy, you know. And, um, and so mercy is grace provides for the need, but mercy by mercy it is given. Grace provides for the need, but by mercy it's given. You know, in a, in, in, a, in a sense. In Hebrews chapter 4 says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace in the time of need. We come to the of th throne of grace. Why? To obtain mercy. Titus is going to need mercy. Paul needed a lot of mercies in his ministry. We'll talk about that. I'm not going to run through that quickly. But uh, 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 I'll, I'll go through that next week. But he says, there's a quote. There's a quote from... I don't read the Daily Bread, but there was a quote from the Daily Bread that I liked. And it says, God's grace is immeasurable. I've got it on your notes. God's grace is immeasurable. His mercy is inexhaustible. His peace is inexpressible. The peace of God that passeth all understanding shall keep our hearts. How do you express that peace? It goes beyond understanding, right? His mercy is inexhaustible. That means God's mercy is everlasting. The book of Psalms talk about that. God's grace is immeasurable. Where sin abounded, grace did what? Much more abound. There's always going to be enough grace for us. It's going to be enough mercy for us. We can't all exist, exhaust God's mercy. Now God's mercy, I'm going to talk about this next week, but God's mercy doesn't always get you out of your circumstance. But God's mercy helps you to deal with your circumstance because you're resting in the grace that is provided for that. That's His mercy for us. Okay? You guys get that? Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we thank You for Your Word that brings us grace, Your message of Your grace, the message of the Gospel of Your grace, in this dispensation of grace that brings us grace and peace. But as we get on with the work, as we get on with our life as believers and we make a, a stand for the truth, we're thankful for your mercy as well from day to day. And we know that you delight in showing mercy and we praise you for that. And we know that your mercy is everlasting. We thank you for the common faith that we can share together, the mutual faith that we can share together and that we can stand together as one and um, for the faith of the gospel. As we pray these things and we thank you for the saints here this morning um, and we pray this by Christ Jesus with thanksgiving. Amen.